Amen. All right, here in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, I'd like to start reading in verse number 3. The Bible says this, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. <clears throat> verse 4, greatly desiring to see thee, then he says this, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance <clears throat> that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now I want to specifically focus on verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. <clears throat> now I've heard this verse preached on quite often. And specifically one thing I'd like to point out in the introduction of this before I get into the meat of the sermon is the context of this particular statement and this verse. Now <clears throat> there in verse number 7 he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So he's mentioning the spirit that God has given us. He's of course speaking of the Holy Ghost. Now why is he addressing this to Timothy? What is he talking about? Well if you look back at verse number 4, Timothy's obviously going through something right now. Verse number 4 it says this, greatly desiring to see thee, and then he says this, being mindful of thy tears. So notice Timothy is struggling with something. He's going through affliction. He's going through problems, right? And I'm doing this to expose the Bible a little bit. It's, it's good for us to understand context of the Bible. A lot of people I feel like miss that oftentimes. In this particular chapter, he uh, repeatedly talks about the afflictions that Paul is going through. I believe that he's relating that to things that Timothy is going through as well. When you get into chapter 2, he talks about him... You know, uh, striving and enduring hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that is relevant to what Timothy's going through. So notice this theme over and over again of Paul's going through trouble, Paul's going through hardness, you're going through hardness, we're both going through hardness, right? Right now he's trying to encourage him. And, if, and obviously you see he's crying, he's being mindful of his tears, and then he goes through and he, and he, and he reminds him of something. Verse number... Six, wherefore I put thee in remembrance. Now, where does wherefore mean? Because of that, or it's, it's therefore, because of that reason, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, where do all gifts come from, from God? Particularly, what is the source? Obviously, God, but the Spirit, amen. The, the source is the Holy Ghost, right? So he's talking about how I laid my hands on you and the Spirit of God is in you. So Timothy is discouraged. Timothy is obviously weeping. He's crying. He's going through problems and trials. Paul's trying to uh, uh, provoke him to endure hardness. Paul reminds him, hey, I'm going through afflictions. And then he reminds him, hey, remember the gift of God which is in you. Remember the, 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 the time that I laid my hands on you and the Holy Spirit came upon you. And then he goes on forward in verse number 7 to remind him what that spirit is and what that spirit does for you. So I hope I'm putting the context together for you so you can understand the purpose of 2 Timothy a little better. Look at verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. That's talking about the Holy Spirit, the spirit that Timothy received. What does that imply that maybe Timothy is, what state Timothy is in at this time? Sounds like he's, he's weeping, he's going through hardness, affliction, he's struggling. What does that imply? That Timothy may be what? Fearful or afraid, right? And then Paul talks about how I'm enduring affliction too. Hey, endure affliction. I know you're going through a hard time. I'm being mindful of your tears, right? So notice he tells him, hey, you have the Spirit. What's he saying? Don't be afraid. Verse number 7, let's read the entirety of the verse once more. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Then he says this, But of power and of love and of a sound mind. <coughs> Notice he gives a couple of characteristics of the Holy Spirit there. And what is it? Power, love, and of a sound mind. Now, Right here, these things are in contrast with fear. That's why he mentions these particular characteristics. The Holy Spirit has a lot of characteristics. Think of the fruit of the Spirit. But why does he, why does he uh, uh, single out these three characteristics of the many? Because these are three characteristics that are in contrast with fear. 
These are polar opposites of fear. Number one, you have power. When a person is fearful, and we're going to see this more, I'm going to focus on this in just a moment. When a person is fearful, they lack power. They lack strength. They're afraid. They're discouraged. They have feeble knees. They're not strong. That's the opposite of uh, having power. Being fearful is a person that doesn't have power. Love. The Bible says perfect love casteth out fear. Notice if there's love there, there's not fear. Fear's there, there's not love. So notice these things are polar opposites. And then the last one is what? A sound mind. When people become fearful, and I'm sure everyone knows this, do you know what else they become? Very irrational. When people become scared, people start panicking. People start, you know, uh, when, they, when, when they get scared of something, what comes next is irrational thoughts always. That's how people operate. All human beings are like this. If someone is afraid, they start saying things and acting in ways they would never act. That's why in, in uh, uh, situations like what we have today, the pandemic that's going on, people will start doing things it, it, that they would never have done. Attacking people, doing crazy things that they never would have done. That's because when you are fearful, you do not have a sound mind. So why does he say, why does he say here, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but, that's a negating conjunction, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, because a person that has a mind that's, that is uh, powerful and sound and also ha having love, possessing love, they're not a fearful person. A person that is fearful is a person that does not have power, that does not have love, and they are lacking a sound mind. The title of the sermon this morning <coughs> is, In a Pandemic, How to Respond as a Christian. In a Pandemic, How to Respond as a as a Christian. Now I first want to define for you what the word pandemic means. Uh, the word pandemic means prevalent over a whole country or the world and that is referring to a disease. A disease which is prevalent over a whole country or the world. Pan means uh, 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 all basically, like if you're going to pan a room, right? If you want to, to uh, if if you were to say, uh, uh, you know, to put like maybe your phone on the pan setting, that's where you're able to see everything. It's full, is what that means. It's all of it. That's what, like a pantheist is someone that believes in, you know, that everything is God, right? So pan there means all or every. The demic part means it comes from a word that means the world. That's what that means, like demographic, right? So <clears throat> it comes from a root word that means world. So what it means is it is the whole world. It's where the whole world is being affected by something. That's what the word pandemic means. And it is specific to a disease. Now there is epidemic, which is a more general word that we'll use about that. But pandemic is specific to a disease that is affecting the entire world. If I had to choose one word to describe the response of the world during this pandemic, and I guarantee that you would say the same thing, I would say fear. If I had to say one word that would summarize everyone's response to what is going on, just one word. Now, there's a lot of words. I told my wife when I got back from Home Depot yesterday morning that the way that I would describe the people that were at Home Depot was, was with one word, confusion. That's how I would describe, I could just see confusion over everyone's face. I saw people there that, you know, <clears throat> when, you, when you play basketball, you can look at someone and tell normally if they, can, if they can play basketball, right? If you play football, you can normally look at, if you're skilled at something, if you do something for a living, you know, I do construction. And I saw tons of people there getting construction materials and building materials and I could tell you don't know what you're doing with that. You don't know, like the way they're holding it, the way they're carrying it, the person it was. I go to Home Depot all the time and sometimes it's busy, but it was never as busy as it was yesterday. And I, and I could tell a difference also. These weren't contractors. These, I could look at the people that were there and if I had to describe them with one word yesterday outside of fear, I would say confusion. They just looked very confused. So confusion would be one word that I, I would use. Tense would be a word that I would use. Right? If I had to use one overall word, because those are all products of another characteristic. And what it is is fear. That is what is, is being spread along with this pandemic. What's being spread throughout the entire world is fear. That is the, that is, has been the world's response. I want to say that in, in the introduction. 
The world's response has been fear. We are not of the world. We are Christians. We do not respond as the world responds. For a couple of reasons. Number one, we don't have the same authority that they have. We're not... My authority guides me in a totally different direction than it guides them. I, 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 number two, I'll go ahead and jump into that. Number two, I have hope and they do not. It would make sense why they're afraid. It would make sense why they're fearful. But I have hope. That's why a Christian's response, those are two reasons why a Christian's response should not be the same as the world's response. I have a different authority than they have. I, different, I have a different philosophy, if you'd like to word it that way better. I have a different philosophy than they do. But overall, <coughs> point number two, the reason why I should respond different as a Christian is because I have hope and they do not. A person that is fearful is a person that is hopeless. They have no hope. They don't know what they're trusting and they don't know what's going to get them through this. Why a Christian should respond differently is because we have hope. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 15. I want to go through some verses where God commands us, or God tells us as Christian, God tells His people to not be fearful. To not be fearful. <clears throat> we as Christians should not fear, the Bible tells us. We have nothing to fear. There's one thing that we should fear, and I'll go ahead and put this out there, is God. <clears throat> That's the only thing that we should fear. But God tells His people over and over again. This is a very specific statement. It's a command. It's something that He desires us to do. And that is fear not. God does not want us to be afraid. That's a powerful statement. Don't let it go over your head. And now we have an application to it in our lives. And I've noticed that certain things in the Bible I may have head knowledge of, but I can tell I'm lacking in understanding. But then once I experience something a little bit more deeper, once I have an application to it, I'm able to grow in wisdom more so in that area. And it's a perfect chance to be able to take this and apply it, all these verses of fear not. When you actually have a, you know, what would be a, 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 <coughs> a more serious reason to fear, it's a great chance to exercise those commandments and, stat and uh, uh, statements from God, fear not. Look at Genesis chapter number 15, look at verse number 1. I'm going to give you some reasons in each verse why God says we shouldn't fear. Look at Genesis chapter number 15, verse number 1. It says this, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So there in chapter number 15 of Genesis, verse number 1, we see God coming to Abram and the very first thing he says to him is what? What does he want Abram to do? He wants to make sure that he's not fearful. He doesn't want him to have fear or, or he doesn't want him to have you know, uh, any sort of fright in his heart. He doesn't want him to be afraid. And he says, hey, Abram, fear not. Now, why does he say that? Why should we not be afraid? What reason, what comfort can he give us? He says this, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What is a shield? It's a protection, right? It's a form of protection. What is the Lord saying? Don't be afraid because I'm going to protect you. That's what he's telling Abram. You know, Abraham, of course. Don't be afraid because I am going to protect you. So why should we hear? What do we learn? <coughs> why we should not be afraid is because God is our protector. God is the one that is going to look out for us. God is the one that is going to protect us. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 21 now. Go to Genesis chapter number 21. <coughs> Verse number 17, the Bible says, And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where, where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. It says, And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. So I want you to notice there that she was in need of provisions, right? And the word provision is, is, is actually derived from our word provide, right? So right here she's in need of provisions. Her son is about to die and she needs water. She's, she's in need of supplies in this situation. She's crying and you know what happens? She becomes fearful because she doesn't have the supplies. She doesn't have the provisions that she needs. The Lord comes and God comes and speaks unto her through an angel and says, Fear not. Why? Because she needs these provisions and then what does God do? 
God provides them. God brings the provisions unto her. He opens her eyes and then she sees a well of water and gives her what she needs. The, the second reason here from Genesis 21 is because God is our provider. So the first reason, God is our protect, protector. The second reason, God is our provider. Go to Genesis chapter 26 verse 24. Genesis chapter number 26 verse number 24. Notice we're not turning very many pages here. I'm going to skip some here in just a few minutes, but very, this is very common where God repeatedly, repeatedly over and over again is telling his people, fear not. Number one, it's because we are fearful. Human beings tend to be afraid. We tend to be scared of things. We tend to walk by sight instead of faith, right? Oftentimes we tend to do that. That's just how we are. We are our faith is not perfect. That's just how we are as people. So that's the first reason is because we tend to be fearful. But the second reason is because God doesn't want us to be afraid. God doesn't want us to fear. Why? Because He wants us to trust in Him. He wants us to lean upon Him as our shield or our protector. He wants us to lean upon Him as our provider. Here in, number, uh, uh, in, in chapter 26, verse number 24, uh, it's speaking, go ahead and read verse number 24. It's speaking of Isaac, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. And he says, And will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. The third reason is because God will keep his promise. God will keep his promise. First, he's our protector. Second, he's our provider. But third, is He will keep His promise. God has promised us things. We have many different promises in the Bible, and God is faithful. I spoke about this a little bit on Wednesday night, how God is faithful. He's someone we can trust. He's someone we can lean upon, and He's not going to go back upon His word. That's what He's telling him here. He says, Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee. Saying, As I told you I was going to bless you, I will bless you, and multiply thy seed for, thy, for my servant Abraham's sake. Because God is faithful. That's another reason why we should not fear, is because God is faithful. When the world starts to lose its cool, when the world starts to become fickle and wavering, and it feels like shifting sand and unpredictable, God is still predictable. God is still predictable and God is still just as faithful even in a pandemic, even in some kind of crisis, even in some kind of trial or tribulation. God is still a rock. God has not changed. The world might change, but God hasn't changed. So this is a reason why we should not fear because God's faithful. Because the same promises that He gave us before are the same promises we have today and nothing has changed about that. God is faithful. I want you to go now to Deuteronomy chapter number 1. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 1. Deuteronomy chapter number 1. We're going to see something that comes with fear. It's related with fear. <clears throat> we saw a few things already and we started there in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. But see some more here, kind of an offshoot of fear. Look at uh, verse number 21, Deuteronomy 1, 21. It says this, Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. And he says, Go up and possess it as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. And then he says, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 3. So notice there he says, Fear not, neither be discouraged. <coughs> so we shouldn't be afraid, and we also shouldn't be discouraged. What's the opposite of being discouraged? Encouraged, encouraged or having courage, right? Exactly, the same thing. Ha having, you know, if, if a person's not discouraged, the opposite of that type of person will be a person that is courageous, right? It's a person that has, that has courage. What does that mean? What is a when a person has courage? That person would be brave. That person would, would be valiant, maybe. That's a good word for that. That person would have power. Notice, just like we read in 2 Timothy chapter number 1. A person that is a courageous person, the, uh, the word courage is used with the word strong all throughout the Bible. It's a person that is a strong person. Referring to their will, it would be a, a strong person. It's a person that has a strong mind, that has a strong heart, that has a strong will. Do you know what he's telling you? He's saying, don't be fearful, don't be discouraged, but be strong. Be strong. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> Look at verse number uh, 2 in chapter number 3. And the Lord said unto him, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people 
and his land into thy hand. Go to verse number 22. I want you to notice it's because God is fighting for us. Now, if I had to be valiant because of my own abilities, if I had to be you know, courageous or strong or, or just had to be confident just because of my own abilities, well, that would be foolish. That would be foolish. That would not make much sense. It doesn't matter how great of a soldier you are. It doesn't matter how, how, how strong you are and how skilled you are at whatever it is. If I were just to be you know, uh, trusting in my own abilities and trusting in my own strength, well, that would be foolish. That would be scary. That would be fearful. Because you don't know if I'm going to have a bad day. You don't know what's going to happen that day. You don't know if I'm going to get injured. You don't know if you know, something is going to get on my mind and kind of cause me to be distracted. Whatever it may be. Maybe not thinking as clearly. That would be scary if I had to just trust in myself. But the reason why we can be valiant, the reason why we can be courageous, the reason why we can have power and strength is because he's fighting for us. It's because he's the one that's going out and battling for us. He is the reason why we should have strength. I want you to look, as I said, at verse number 22. It says again, Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God, he shall fight for you. So why should we not be afraid over and over and over again? It's because he's with us. Because he's our provider. Because he has promised us. Because he is our protector. Because he is the one that's going forward. And he's the one that's fighting for us. Because the Lord is with us. It's not because of our own abilities. It's not because we look around and we see the state of the world and it seems smooth. It's not because see, things seem like the stock market's climbing. Or things seem like they're getting better economically. That's not why we should not fear. The reason why we should not fear is because the Lord is with us. Amen. Because He's our provider. Because He's our protector. Because He is the one that's there that's promised us. And He's the one that's with us. And He's going to guarantee that we get the victory. Go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter number 20. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 20. Look at verse number 3 and 4. We'll see this again. And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. Why? Verse 4. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Go to Deuteronomy 31. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 31. <clears throat> Notice what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. We'll see a contrast now of what we read before. Verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not. So again, notice, you know what's opposite of, of being afraid? Being strong and being courage, uh, courageous or encouraged, as Brother Hall said. That's the opposite of being afraid. Just like we saw that God hath, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Look at verse 7. <clears throat> oh, finish verse 6. <clears throat> Nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God, he it, is, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Over and over and over again, what do we see the reason why we should not be afraid? What should we be focusing on in order to not be afraid? The Lord. We should be focusing on the Lord. What does it say here? Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, he says, nor be afraid of them. Why? For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with you. Amen. So it's God that's going with us. And then he says, he will not fail thee. Those are precious words. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That's a promise. He will not. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So we can, we can make sure we can you know, uh, uh, be positive that God is not going to leave us nor forsake us. Therefore, we have nothing to be afraid of. We can know for certain that God will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And not only that, He's not going to fail us. He can promise you the victory prior to that. Go to Joshua chapter number 8, verse number 1. Joshua chapter number 8, verse number 1. <clears throat> We'll see this again about uh, discouraged. It's kind of worded in a different way. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Then he goes on, Take all the people of war with thee. Arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. It was as good as done. You know what he told Joshua? 
He said, fear not, neither be, be thou dismayed. Dismayed is like being discouraged. May is like you want to do something. Like may I? Right? It's talking about your will. Like what you want to do. So he's saying don't be dismayed like to lose your will or to be against your will of what you want to do. That's what that means. So he's telling them, fear not. Now notice he, he's telling this over and over again to all different sorts of Christians. All different types of Christians. The whole nation of Israel. Different leaders. Different patriarchs. All throughout history. He gives the same command to all Christians. Fear not. It's very obvious and it's very clear that God does not want us to fear. He does not want us to have fear in our hearts. And I want you to notice that all of these people were in different situations and scenarios. And in each and every situation and scenario, God says, fear not. Fear not. And then he gives us all the reasons and they can all be summarized in this. Because God is with you. Because God is with you is the reason why you should not fear. Go to Joshua 10. <clears throat> Joshua 10. Let's finish these out. Joshua chapter number 10. Look at verse number 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Look at verse 25. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of a good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. So she shouldn't fear man. He said, Fear them not. Go to... Uh, Judges chapter number 6, last place we're going to turn in the Old Testament for this. We're just going through chronologically right now. <clears throat> Judges chapter number 6, and I want you to look at verse number 10. <clears throat> and I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Go to verse number 23. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not. Thou shalt not die. Now I want you to notice too of something that comes with not being afraid. What? Peace. Do you notice that he says, peace be unto thee, and he says, fear not. A person that is a, a peaceful person is a person that is not afraid. A person that is fearful, that is just overcome of fear, and is just full of fear, is a person that is not peaceful. These things are not, they don't go together. A person that has a sound mind is a person that is full of peace. See how, 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 you can see how certain characteristics, what fear does is it forces out a lot of other good things that you need. And, and what it does is people become overcome of fear and the fear runs a lot of other emotions like confusion, like people being tense, like people becoming irritable even. That's why, you know, uh, 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 people become very selfish when they become fearful. That's why people start harming people at the stores and, you know, they're fighting. You know, you know uh, some, some, some man is like beating up a woman to like make sure they get the last roll of toilet paper and things along this line. They become very irrational, but uh, 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 why are they doing these types of things? Because they're becoming very selfish. They just start thinking about it. Fear, fear is a very, very powerful emotion and it's a very, very dangerous emotion. Because it pushes out a lot of other good qualities that God wants us to have. It forces out a lot of good qualities. That's why God, because if you look in the Bible, this is not just a small subject. This is not something that's mentioned a lot. It's in Genesis 15 when, when, when Abraham gets saved. It's all throughout the Old Testament when God comes to men of God and leaders. Oftentimes we read over this statement, but when he comes to them, he'll tell them, Fear not. That's one of the very first things that he'll say to them. In prominent passages, before he's getting ready to deliver a massive message to them, to preach the gospel to Abraham. When Abraham gets saved, when he comes to Isaac, when Isaac's traveling and he repeats the gospel, do you know what he says? Fear not. Do you know when they're getting ready to go in to possess the land in Israel? Do you know what he says repeatedly over and over again? Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Do you know why? Because God, of course, knows how dangerous fear can be. Because God knows how dangerous and how harmful fear can be to us when it creeps into our lives. It can destroy a person because it is a specific emotion that overcomes that person. It takes over and it makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do. It makes you think in ways that you wouldn't normally think. Go to, uh, I want you to go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 41. Isaiah chapter number 41. <coughs> <clears throat> mm. 
Isaiah chapter number 41. A couple of passages I want to read in the book of Isaiah here. <clears throat> Some promises when, when the children of Israel were going through trials and tribulations. When, as we read about in Lamentations, the same events are taking place in Israel and in Jerusalem. We see them being, the city being ransacked. We see, you know, just the, the whole city being pillaged and destroyed flattened, the temple being destroyed, people being killed, carried away captive. I mean, they are in a serious, a serious crisis. Look at how God is speaking unto His people. Look at Isaiah chapter number 41, look at verse number 10. Fear thou not. Why? For I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Why? For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shalt not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will uphold thy right hand, saying unto thee, watch this, Fear not, I will help thee. Notice that. Why? He says, because I'm going to uphold you. I'm going to hold your right hand, he says, and I'm going to say unto you, fear not, I will help thee. Verse 14, fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. What does God emphasize there over and over and over again? Why should we not be afraid? Because He's going to be there with us. Because He's going to help us. Go to Isaiah chapter number 43. I want you to notice the, how emphatically He repeats this over and over and over again. He wants to drive this point in. Look at verse number 1. But now thus saith the Lord <coughs> that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. Watch this. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Verse 5, fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. This is God speaking directly to you. To his people, to God's people. You know what he says over and over and over again? He doesn't want you to be afraid. He keeps saying it. We can see the, the, the choice of words over and over again. And he keeps saying, fear not. Fear not. Neither be afraid. Neither be dismayed. Neither be terrified. Neither be afraid. Over and over and over again. And he repeats himself over and over and over again here even in the book of Isaiah. Fear not. And you know what he follows it up with each time? Fear not. And he says, for I am the Lord thy God. Fear not, for I am with thee. We should not be afraid. We should not have fear. That's very clear. Amen. Even if we were passing through waters, you should not be afraid. Even when the children of Israel were going through the waters. Now, I don't know if you know what's it's being discussed there in verse number 2, but it's in chronological order. When they're passing through the waters, it's talking about when literally the Red Sea opened up and just millions of, over 2 million uh, uh, you know, I think it's a million and a half. A million and a half Israelites went through the, the middle of the sea. Of, of, you know, a sea, I mean, it's massive. And they just walked through it. And you know what he said? He didn't want them to be afraid. And they had no reason to be afraid. Fear not. Not only that, the rivers. When did that take place? Exactly when they crossed the Jordan and they went into the promised land. So notice it's in chronological order. And what's interesting as well is he, he mentions the fire... The, what pops into my mind there is, of course, Daniel. Right? That hasn't happened yet, but it, that's what pops into my mind. He, he's like, even if you go through fire, even if you had to walk through fire, you shouldn't be afraid. I mean, can you imagine that? Having to walk through fire? 
but he promises that the flame's not going to kindle upon you. Isn't that amazing? It's obviously in some way a reference to Daniel and them, where, where <coughs> three men were literally thrown into a furnace. And they're standing in the midst of the flame. They come out, their garments aren't singed, they don't even smell like smoke. Sometimes we forget who God is and the power that God has. Sometimes you forget when you get caught up in the world and living by sight each day that He's the God of the fire. He's the God of the water. You know, He's the God of all. He is the God of gods. He controls everything. This is His universe and His world. Everything is, you know, is at His beck and call, if you will. And right here we have just the, the strongest scenarios, the most severe tribulations and trials being described. And in each one, He tells you, don't fear. If you're going through the waters, don't fear if you're going through the river. Don't fear if you're going through the fire. Why? He says, for I am with thee. Go to Isaiah 44. See this again. Isaiah 44, verse 1. Yet not here, old Jacob. Yet now, I'm sorry. Yet now here, old Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, old Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeseron, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare and set in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming? And shall come, he says, let him show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. There he's talking about how he prophesied of this coming in the first place. And that proves that he is the Lord because he, he knew of these things coming to pass. And because that says, fear ye not, neither be afraid, have not I told thee from that time and have declared it. Saying he knew that this was going to happen, just showing his power and his greatness. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 4. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 54, verse 4. <coughs> the point is very clear that God does not want us to be afraid. And he doesn't want us to be afraid of anything. Why? Because He's with us. It doesn't matter what state the world is in. It doesn't matter what condition the world is in. As far as it goes with God, nothing has changed. He's the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 4. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Last verse of, uh, of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 35. <clears throat> Isaiah 35. So God wants us to be encouraged. God wants us to be strong and be full of power. He wants us to have a sound mind. He wants us to be able to think clearly. He wants us to, to, to have uh, the good wisdom and discernment to be able to make good decisions. He wants us to cast out fear so that we can do all of those things. He doesn't want us to be overcome of fear. He doesn't want us to be filled with fear. He wants us to fear not. As Christians, God does not want us to be afraid in any situation. And we should also be seeking uh, uh, ways in which to make sure that our brethren are not afraid. We need to be making sure that we are causing our brethren to be strengthened, encouraged, and not afraid of what is uh, possibly going to happen or, or, or in any situation. Look at Isaiah 35 verse 3. <clears throat> Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. So their God is just speaking unto the nation of Israel in general. And he tells them to strengthen the weak hands. 
He says, and confirm the feeble knees. The weak hands are when people's hands are shaking and they're held down beside them. This is also quoted in Hebrews chapter number 12. The feeble knees is like talking about somebody who has weak knees, right? When a person gets scared, uh, uh, this actually happens with Belteshazzar. His legs literally begin to quake and they're hitting back and forth. This is a real thing when people are just overcome with fear. They just start to shake uncontrollably because of their nerves, right? They just can't. That's the same reason why you're trembling. But to the point literally where your legs are shaking. And he's saying, hey, strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. What is he saying? that uh, the, the knees are weak and firm means to strengthen again, right? Confirm. Then he says there in verse 4, Say to them of a fearful heart, Be strong and fear not. We should be trying to seek opportunities right now while the world is in chaos, while the world is afraid, while the world is, is, is just so scared out of their minds. We should be looking for opportunities to confirm the feeble knees. We should be taking this as an opportunity. We as Christians should be stepping up when everyone is fearful and making sure that we are strengthening the weak hands. That we are confirming the feeble knees. And why? Again, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Because our God. The same reason over and over and over again. Why? Because of our God. Why should we not be afraid? Because of our God. Why? Because He is with us. Because the Lord is with us. This is a perfect opportunity for us to grow in our Christianity. To where we're reaching out to others and we're strengthening others that are afraid. It's, it's a, a perfect opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to put others before us in our Christian life. It's to strengthen others and to concern ourselves with others. <clears throat> Go to... Uh, I'm going to have you turn to... I'll just read these other passages for you. Let's skip these other ones. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 46. The, uh, in the New Testament, a couple of different times we're told not to worry. And this comes with fearing. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So notice that we're not supposed to take thought for the morrow in the sense of being afraid. In the sense of being scared. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So what does that mean? It means not to worry. It means not to be afraid. It's not telling you not to take any, any common sense steps to maybe prepare for something that's going on. But it's telling you not to be afraid. Not to worry or not to be fearful. Same thing in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Just worded a, a little differently. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. So notice he says, Be careful for nothing. What does it mean to be careful? Exactly, full of care, right? You're, you're, you're just, you care so much about something. He's saying, don't be just concerned or worried or just you know, so, so uh, 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 you know, full of care about everything that's going on. He's saying, be careful for nothing. Don't concern or be worried about everything. But he says, about nothing. He says, but, make, but in everything, make prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. What does that mean? Don't sit there and worry and concern about things, but make those prayers and supplications known unto God. What you do is the way that you receive peace is in this moment of maybe worry or care or fear, you take those fears to God. The same one that promised you, I will be with you. Do you know what, you know what else we could do? Not only could we strengthen others in this time of, of trial, tribulation, and crisis, we could strengthen our prayer life. If you're more worried or, 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 or concerned about something, then we can take our prayers to God. We can take our concern, we can take our worry, we can take our anxiety to Him and read the verses to receive strength from God where He says, Fear not, for I am with thee. That's to you, my friend. Sometimes we read this and we don't apply it you know, to ourselves. That's to you. Fear not, for I am with thee. He says, I'll hold your right hand as we go through the problems. That I'll be there the entire time. That is comforting. See, what you can do is you can understand that comfort and every time a problem arises, every time a worry arises or sticks its head up, do you know what you do? 
You just take that prayer to God. You take that worry to God in prayer. You take that problem or, pro or trial and you just pray to the Lord about it. And, we, and you put your faith in the Lord about it. And people say, yeah, but this is serious. This is a really serious situation. I want you to look with me at Psalm chapter number 46. I'd like to say this before just, just, uh, just address it generally. <clears throat> God is God no matter what. He's the God, he, as I said earlier, He doesn't change. And there is no problem that's too big for Him. For God, it's not like God's power like, only covers certain amount of crisis. Like one crisis, he, can, he just handles that with ease, but another crisis, he's like expending most of his power. That's not how it works with the Lord. There is no problem or trial. You hear people say this all the time. It almost becomes cliche. It almost becomes, you know, um, um, how can I word this? It just kind of goes over our head because of that. Like there is no problem too big for God. Well, that's true. There is no problem too big for God. Amen. He, is, he is just... There is no issue that arises that he cannot handle. He is the creator of this universe. He is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. His power does not diminish and he doesn't just kind of cap out in certain trials or tribulations. There's nothing too big for God. There is no problem that you can face in your life. There is no crisis. There is, there is not a, a, a possible crisis that you could dream up that would be too large for the Lord. Look at Psalm chapter number 46, verse number 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear. Though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Now I want you to notice that obviously this is exaggeratory. This is him just dreaming up exactly like I said, the most, the, the biggest crisis, natural catastrophe that, that you could possibly even imagine. And there he says, though the earth be removed. He's talking about the dry land. Though the dry land be removed, just all the earth, the dry land just, is just gone from underneath our feet. And then he says, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And the mountains just be cast into the sea. The point is there's no dry land left. There's no earth left. And then he says too, though the waters thereof. So now there's just water left. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled. So there's a, an extreme, you know, there's a typhoon going on on top of this. And the streams whereof, I'm sorry, the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And then he says, Selah. But what was the point of that? Verse number two. Therefore will not we fear. Even in that type of scenario, even in the most extreme situation, David says, I'm not going to be afraid. I don't care if the dry land is removed. I don't care if... If <coughs> the earth is removed, I don't care if there's a typhoon. I don't care if the worst natural catastrophe, and it's just, it's cataclysmic. Therefore will we not fear. Amen. Therefore will we not be afraid. Why? God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. In uh, Psalms, I want you to go to Psalm 27 now. Flip over to Psalm 27. Flip around a little bit. Psalm chapter number 27, see this again. <clears throat> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. So notice that first we read about natural disasters. There in Psalm, what was it, 47? 46. Psalm 46, natural disasters. And what did it say? Because the Lord is our refuge and our tower and our strength, we're not going to be afraid. Now we read of man, 
of man's devices, man attacking us. And he even says war. You know what he says? I'm not going to be afraid. He says, my heart shall not fear. Do you know what it takes? It takes great faith. That's what it takes. What it is is, it's a trial of your faith. In times of tribulation and trouble and problems, do you know what people do? Do you know what the first response is? Fear. Fear. Exactly. It's the very first response. This pandemic, as soon as it arose, do you know what started happening immediately? Fear. People were afraid. Every time there's a disease, Ebola, H1N1, every, every, all of it. Anytime something arises, any kind of crisis, do you know what happens? Do you know what emotion people feel? When there's problems, trials, tribulations, issues, crisis, fear immediately. When fear comes in, do you know what goes out? Faith. I'll give you a perfect example. Peter. Peter, when he, when he sees the Lord walking on the, the sea, Peter's in the boat, he sees Jesus, and what does Peter want to do? He wants to walk on the water. Do you know what that pictures? That is a perfect picture of him walking through the trial with the Lord because the sea was raging. There was a storm during that time. That's him wanting to be and needing to be with the Lord during that trial. And he goes and he steps out on the water and he begins to walk on the water. And he's able to do so for a moment, but then what happens? Do you know what happens is he becomes afraid. He begins to become fearful. Once he stood there and he actually saw the storm, once he stood there and he actually saw the, the, the winds raging, the waters tossing, once he actually looked at it, do you know what he did? He started to walk by sight as opposed to by faith. Now when he was in the boat before the problem came, before the trial came, before the tribulation came, before the pandemic hit, he had the faith. He was ready to do it. Then he stepped out on the waters and now he has to face the problem. Now he has to actually look there and he's taking a risk and it looks scary. It looks fearful. He sees the storm, the lightning, the waters, the rain, the seas are raging. And you know what starts to creep into his heart? Fear. And you know what starts to creep out of his heart at the same time? Faith. What enabled him to walk in the first place, did Jesus say? Faith. So you know why he ended up sinking? Lack of faith. Fear takes away the most important thing that we need. Faith. That's why fear is so dangerous. Because when fear comes in, it kicks a lot of other things out. And you know the most important thing that it kicks out? Faith. It kicks, it removes faith. They both can't, they cannot coexist with one another. Just like perfect love casteth out fear. You know, it's either fear or love. It's either fear or a sound mind. It's either fear or power. It's either fear or faith. Faith is the most important thing. If you don't have faith, you don't have anything. Without, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You're not going to make it without faith. faith. Faith is the most important thing. And you know what the enemy always tries to instill into your heart? Fear. Because they know if they can put fear into your heart, they can remove your faith. There is an agenda to make you afraid. There is an agenda to cause you to fear. That You know what their number one agenda is, and it couldn't be more obvious? Fear. To instill fear into the hearts of the citizens of the United States, especially all around the world. The only way that you're going to give up your, liber your liberties and your rights is if you're afraid. You become vulnerable, you become scared, and people that are scared and vulnerable, they're just seeking safety and they're just seeking protection and help. When a person becomes fearful, they'll just, they'll, it's, you know, they, they basically just cast all of their uh, uh, values out the window. They, ca they, they, they become a different person. That everything that they care about, they stop caring about. You know why? Because you become enslaved to fear. You become... You become the servant of fear. Fear is extremely dangerous and it's extremely powerful. And that's why God repeatedly says, fear not. Fear not. Look at Psalm chapter 118 and then we're going to go to one other place and we're going to end there. Psalm chapter number 118. <clears throat> Psalm 118. 
I'm just going to read verse number 6. <coughs> I have it in my notes. I'd like to go ahead and read it. He says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Go to Psalm chapter number 71 and we'll, we're going to end there. So we saw the natural cataclysms, right? The natural catastrophes. We shouldn't be afraid. We saw all different types of, of scenarios with Abram, with Moses, with Joshua, with the Israelites in general. God said, fear not. We saw that we should not fear man. We saw, saw that we should not fear war. We saw all of these different scenarios... Very serious scenarios where we should not fear. We, you know, and like I said, what if somebody says, yeah, but this is, this is serious. This is a crisis. This is a natural or a worldwide crisis. Kind of like the, the earth being removed. Like, kind of like the mountains being cast into the sea. You know, kind of like that type of serious. And what did David say? I'm not afraid. I'm not going to fear. Why? Because God's with me. What if some, somebody said this? Yeah, but this is a pandemic. Pandemic. 